This car is the most honest car you've ever seen. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. This is JP, and my guest today is Katerina Kuvalova. Katerina, how are you today? Mm, thank you. I'm good. Thank you for having me. The joy is on our side, Katerina. And for those who might not know you, Katerina is a star in the classic motorsport scene and competes in races all over the globe. Uh, so, Katerina, where do we find you today? Well, I'm home in Hamburg, in Germany, and uh, sitting in the office and trying to catch up on many things, you know, because the classic car is just keeping me away, you know, from work sometimes. Of course. And the work doesn't uh, wait for, until you're back from one of the racetracks. Um, let me start with a very emotional question just right from the beginning, right on the starting line. Do you remember your first ever race you started in? <laughs> So my first race was exactly 10 years ago in 2014. Wow. And I'm, yeah, it's already wow. Um, it feels like yesterday. And, you know, how could you forget your first race? I would just yeah. almost answer with a question. And it was a 24-hour race in uh, in Portugal, in Portimao, which is a very technical, demanding track. And uh, I raced there with the Bentley, so with a pre-war, four and a half liter Bentley. My goodness, it was so exciting. And, uh, you know, it was all like everything new to me, everything from circuits to all the terminology, you know, about racing. I, I just had my license for two months before. So yeah. it was a baptism of fire. I have to say, starting in such a large Bentley, I mean, uh, evil people say they're attractors, but I really love them. I mean, they look beautiful and they're heavy to handle in a sense, aren't they? Yes, they, in terms of weight, surely they are, you know, handful cars. I think, and I claim always is about the technique, how you yeah. drive them. It's not about the power, you know. Absolutely. But coming back to the feelings at the starting grid, I mean, um, what was running through your head? Mainly I was afraid to sort of miss something or just do a mistake, you know, just to embarrass myself, obviously. Yeah. Um, I was looking forward to that, but the fear, I still remember, I've been sweating before I started. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm just going to mess up the whole thing. And the funny thing on that was that this first race wasn't a usual race because it was um, an abergery, you know, from the Bentley boys race, uh, 90 years uh, from the first race in Le Mans. Yeah. So with the same start procedure as they did back in time, it means we had to run to the car, close the hood and do our 20 laps, as you know, uh, with closed hood. So the start was rather unusual. So I was thinking about this, how am I going to do it? And I'm, you know, something is surely going wrong. And, but, you know, long story short, it's, it, it was all, all good. And, you know, after two laps, I think I started to breathe again. I think I didn't breathe Very good. for two laps. I mean, uh, that's a bit like the Cresta Run, which also uh, you are familiar with. Uh, so Cresta Run St. Moritz means you go down a natural ice channel, head forward on a toboggan. And when you do it for the first time, your instructor, who is called the Guru, uh, will give you the advice, don't forget to breathe. And I can tell you, it is exactly like that. You end up after the run, after your first time you run down, you end up excited, of course, full of adrenaline. And then you take a deep breath because you actually really forgot to breathe. Um, but Katrina, how did all this racing uh, start for you? So what is your connection to cars? Well, I'm not coming from a car-related family, so I'm a little bit the black car sheep of the family. <laughs> and no one is doing it. No one knows what's going on, what's wrong with me, why I'm doing cars. Um, I think it was more the influence from my friends. Yeah. So when I moved to Hamburg, um, I just it had just happened to have you know that I had friends who had classic cars or yeah. you know just loved cars. So I entered the classic car club and, uh, you know, all of a sudden I was joining all these events and, uh, you know, was a co-driver, navigator and one day a driver. And, you know, I'm sure everybody finds, finds it for themselves. I knew straight away after five miles, like, this is it. 
Nice. I love it. I mean, this is way better than being a coal driver. Yeah. So, you know, that was the first step. And I somehow knew, you know, there's no way back. But to be fair, it needs also a bit of talent to drive on historic uh, racetracks in historic cars. Um, were you ever aware that you have this talent? Because you have it, obviously, because um, otherwise you wouldn't enjoy it in that sense. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, I never sort of had the certain plan I go and I'm going to be a, you know, race car driver. Yeah. I was a spectator for many years before I started in Goodwood, you know, I was sitting on the grandstands and sort of dream about it to be one day down there in the pit lane and just doing, doing it myself. Yeah. But I never believed I'm, I'm going to do it. Where, and this is a connection to BMW and I have fantastic memories. I used to drive, I used to own a BMW Z3 uh, yes. M Coupe, which I wow. absolutely loved. The little sneaker. That's the little sneaker. And I, I, I think I used to drive for eight years uh, mm -hmm. here in Germany. And my office was about 30 kilometers away from the city. So I did my 60 kilometers a day in this car on the highway. And I'm convinced about it that my love for speed just started there. Because, you know, I had this daily rounds uh, from Hamburg to the office and back and, you know, overtaking, of course, speeding. And I just <laughs> somehow feel that everything's my love for speed started there with that car. We are very happy to hear that, that the BMW is the base of your racing career. Yes, it's really so nice. Yes, it is. I'm convinced <laughs> but, about it. And what a good, it, it was I a good choice. I have to buy back the car, yeah. Uh, we will find you some. I will have a look. I will, I will, which color was it? Do you remember? Was it the dark blue one? blue, dark blue. Yes, yes, best color yes, ever. Yes. we we'll find you, you know, one. Wider tires and it was like just the best spec. And yes. I have fantastic memories to, the, to those years. I mean, there's that three old, ticks all the boxes, the long hood. And it suits you, I would say. that uh, If you would ask me which BMW from the past I would see you in, I think that would be the one. Or even a nice Z1, but just for cruising. Yeah, um, that's right. But the Z3 um, Coupe is very, very nice. Really cool. -y. That's... Uh, that's <laughs> when you ask about, you know, what all, well, everything started with me with the, with love for speed. I really remember those years and, yeah. you know, collected many speeding tickets and all. Yes. You know. <laughs> but a disclaimer, still, we are part of the BMW uh, group. Don't speed. Please drive carefully <laughs> and follow all the rules and uh, do crazy things on the track or on closed uh, roads. And I think racing drivers know this very best because all racing drivers are very humble drivers on the road, actually. They're not going crazy because they know, you know, they know they can drive. They don't need to show off something. That's my experience. I absolutely agree. And I can only speak from my own experience. I changed my style and way of driving on, you know, in a daily driver uh, in the traffic. Uh, before, as I just mentioned, you know, I just loved yeah. that speed and, you know, the kick, little bit of adrenaline. I'm the most relaxed and maybe boring driver in the, in the daily <laughs> traffic these days. Because exactly, you know, the racetrack is the, is the place where yeah. you want to have it all. You can have it all. So... Yeah, I love that. Too. So, uh, kids out there, listen to what Katerina is saying. She is right. Um, Katerina, when you were starting uh, this first race in uh, Potim uh, was Potimao? Yes, that's right. What was the perception of the outside world when you were coming up there on a 24-hour race? I think you drove in a team because it's 24 hours. Was that the start of the Bentley Bells? That's right. Nice. So it was a female-only team. Yeah, exactly. It was female only, woman only team. The first one which ever done 24 hours in the Bentley. Yeah. And so uh, my first race. So it was, you know, it was quite a significant year for me and experience. So, yeah. And Katerina, what were the reactions to this women's only team competing in this men's world? I think it was a bit of a surprise for everyone. Uh, so first of all, that, you know, all female team just rocked up at the, at, you know, at the race. And then we really came together and just were up to this challenge. So just the fact that four women come to a 24-hour race, I never raced before. It was just this, this mixture of, of these new things for everyone. And yeah. the feedback was absolutely fabulous. So we had massive support from everyone. Um, it was a certain level of admiration for, for, you know, just for the fact that we, we were up to it, go and race 24 hours. Yeah. And I can only say we had uh, we had really good experience with being the only female team 
on start and for a long time we were the old female team, you know, in other races afterwards. So, but this is 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, so many things, in my opinion, changed in the last 10 years in terms of female and women in the, in the motorsport. Yeah. And I think it's great to see because there are more all-female teams in the modern racing. Yes. You see more races, women in historic races. And I think this is, this is just the right way to go. Yeah. The more we see it, the more normal it gets. And we're speaking about 10 years ago, and I think it was not normal. And I can confirm that because the only ones I knew, as I said, were Gabi von Oppenheim, you, and, uh, and Queenie Laumann. That's right. Please, everyone forgive me, those I haven't now mentioned, but it was very few. Um, I like sometimes to speak about idols and inspirational ones. And I know for a fact that there is someone from a former time, far, far former time, from nearly 100 years ago, uh, Elizabeth Unek. I know that she's quite of an idol, if I may say so for yourself. Who was Mrs. Unek? Yeah, well, Mrs. Unek, Elish, Elish Kayunkova and her, you know, original Czech name, um, one of my idols from, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. She was a Czech uh, Bugatti driver, racer uh, by heart. And she was very successful, considering, you know, how difficult those times were for women anyway yeah. in, the, in the car world. Um, she raced very successful in Targa Florio. Um, I think she did not finish the race, but she was running, I think, second overall when I'm, when I'm correct. Yes. And just think about the result. I mean, mm. until today, you know, the, being in the overall results in the top three is something what is, what is a massive achievement. And, um, sadly her husband then passed away and she stopped racing, but she was on yeah. the very successful path and. She completed so many races successfully. She had uh, many trophies, uh, you know, from, from her racing. So, you know, when I'm looking back, it was the 2030s, it's, it's just like, you know, of course she's a hero for me, you know, yeah. heroine, uh, not only for me. Mary Petra Bruce, the same story with Bentleys. Crazy, uh, so yes. So all the records she did, 24 hours in Brooklyn on her own. With, um, I think average speed was 98 miles an hour, average speed in the 24 hours. I, yeah, I imagine, think it's, it, imagine. Yeah, exactly. I think right. this is impossible for us these days to just replicate and do it in the, in the same car. So they were really something special, um, all of the women from that period, but Eliska sure from Czech Republic, yeah. Uh, because you have I mean, a special uh, feeling. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a special connection because you're born in the same region, let's say, right? So I think that's uh, also something beautiful. And I remember, I think she drove a yellow Bugatti Type 35, if I'm that's not mistaken. Right. Fantastic. I mean, do we know where the car is? Well, supposed to be in Czech Republic somewhere. Mm -hmm. Not in one piece, I think, is trip so far. I heard yeah. that, you know, if I could just get hands on this car, that would be quite something. So, you know. Even though <laughs> that we don't want to do advertising uh, for another very expensive and time-consuming hobby of yours, but if someone knows what happened to the fantastic yellow Bugatti, please let us know and we will forward this to Katharina. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, the same is with Marie Teresa de Filippis. She was also like, I mean, in Italy, the macho country number one at that time, racing Maserati 250s. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. You, look, you are a good driver. Uh, Gabi is a good driver. Queenie is a good driver. You're all very skilled, very knowledgeable. And that's what it's all about. It's not about uh, the gender uh, of the driver of the car. I think that we had, and it's getting better, with a lack of role models in, in, in motorsport for us women. And that is the major issue or problem, I think, because we just, you know, don't have anyone we can look up at, you know, it's just, as you said, you know, back in time, and Ishka Yunek, this is like half a century back, even more. Yes. Um, so this is getting better. So I'm really supporting women in the motorsport. And if I can, I just always take like co-drivers, female one or navigators, because yeah. we just want, you know, we just have to make a point. What is the reason why there are so few female drivers? You said once as the role model is missing a little bit. So what has to change then? I mean, Still, I'm not a big follower of Formula One, but I don't understand why we don't have Formula One female driver in the grid. I don't get it. I think the problem is, you know, Formula One, there are 20 drivers and it's very difficult to get 
among them to get into Formula One. Sure. And there's so many talented men. And this is a men's world. This is a, you know, it's a sport mainly for men. So it's very, very hard just to, you know, find the spot or just prove yeah. that you I have to ride for the spot, you know, to be one out of the 20 on the former one grid. So it's very difficult in, in general for everyone. Sure. And sure, I mean, w women lacking the, the role model in former one, when we just stay with them. And um, we had some, we had um, Susie Wolf, right? Big in time as a test driver for Williams. Yeah. We have currently Jamie Chadwick. Um, she's around and so on. So now it's really starting to be better. In the last 10 years, uh, we had an all-female team in uh, in Le Mans. Yes, which uh, was very cool. Very cool. With Vanina X, who did yep. six times Le Mans. So I think we do have them. We just don't hear about them. We just don't have it, you know, on the TV screens, on the, you know, on a daily basis yep. and so on. So when a small child, a small girl is growing up and she comes up to parents as you know, and said, so I, I, I want to be a race car driver. I don't think it finds the positive response because it is still very unusual. It is a very unusual sport for girls in general. And, um, you know, slowly it's coming up, but I think it's going to take still some time, some decades until, until we will see a woman in a Formula One. It's my personal opinion. I mean, let's advocate for that a little bit. And I agree, of course, this is the uh, uh, highest league of racing in terms also for uh, long distance racing, like like uh, Lomo endurance racing. In rally sports, you see also lots of women. Uh, Dani Akil from Saudi Arabia, who does an amazing job in Dakar. Like really, it's, uh, this person is a good driver, yes or no, full stop, that's it. The car doesn't care, Mia. Very well said, the, the, the car doesn't know any gender. Let's make a shirt. A car, a racing car does not know any gender. Yes. I will, uh, I will put this one in the classic driver shop. I yes. like the idea of that one. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are many, many women out there who would like to pursue a career in racing. What would be your advice for them? Well, to start with is just really just do it. Um, you cannot start with racing. This is, you know, this is to, there's a, there's a certain way before, and I think the girls don't know. That's the point. They don't know how to start. So, you know, on the practical side, I would recommend just go out there, book a track day, in a road, mm -hmm. take your own road car. It's absolutely, it doesn't matter which car, just do a couple of laps on the circuit and you will figure out very quickly if that is something for you or if it's not. Um, it's just jumps on you, you know, the spark comes straight away. And if not, you better leave it because yeah. it, it is, you know, very well. And once I you do know, actually, yes. <laughs> yeah, you do agree. I, I guess this is the same for men, I think, you know, how to start, just go out there and see if you, if you sort of, uh, you know, if you like the speed and then the technical side of it. And, and once you like it, you just stay with it and just don't give up. This is just what I always say, you know. I think so too. And um, we may add, build your circle. Very important, yeah. This is uh, also a gender neutral advice because that applies to everyone who wants to go into racing. Build your network, find the right people, get advice, listen to people, but do your own thing. I couldn't agree more because when I came, you know, when I started, you know, my, I would say is racing, I didn't know anyone. So only with help of my friends, I made the step and I knew how to get there, how to, you know, how to enter a race, how to, which car I need. So I had billions of questions and yeah. without really the right friends, as you said, it's very difficult. So yeah, go and ask. No one died when you ask, just could you. Exactly. Uh, so definitely. Yeah, I agree. And what was the coolest thing someone, again, gender neutral, someone said to you after a race? Yes, sure. You know, I mean, you can only imagine, you know, when you when you race and you have ninety nine percent or ninety five percent men in your race and you are you are in the absolute minority, you get to hear many <laughs> good quotes from your uh, <laughs> fellow. You know, yeah. I really, I really have to. You know, in you my know. imagination, I see a grumpy white old man being very depressed that you put him into place. And, and he was arrogant. That would be like a film set in a sense. You know, Jack, Jackie Stewart, now it's coming back to me. Jackie yeah. Stewart once, because uh, he's always in Goodwoods and uh, yeah. we know each other now. Uh, and, and first time, I think, first, second time when we met, he was very funny. He said, where have been race car drivers like you when I was racing? I mean, I was in a wrong period. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's they are very good quotes from, from many, but I remember Jackie's now. It's a very nice one. Um, when do you think that all this topic 
in terms of racing will be really inclusive and gender neutral and gender equal. When do you think that point will come? Well, I wish soon, but personally, I I don't think so. It's any soon. I think it will take time mm. for many reasons, natural reasons, which we have, we have no influence on. And it, it will take time. I think it's the right way how are things happening with the female, you know, with a female presence in the motorsport in general and yeah. the automotive world. You know, it's not only motorsport, it's not only race car drivers. You see them in the teams, in the background, um, they yeah. do data. It's very impressive. And this is getting more and more. But I wish I'm going to see it in my life, but I think it will take a couple of decades, if not more, until we're really gender natural. I mean, everyone, do your bit to make this happen, if possible. If you're in racing, if you're in motorsport, if you're in the automotive industry, if you run a club or whatever, let's all make this possible. So really it should be only about the driving skills and the passion for it. And now we speak about the passion again, because you mentioned uh, Portimao as a very technical track. What would you say is your most liked track for racing? I mean, it's a bit of a tricky question because your variety of cars you're racing is ranging from a pre-war Bentley to racing cars from the 60s. And I think every car has its own ability on the track. And so that makes the one track better. Goodwood maybe as a, as a very narrow track better for a small car rather than for a big car or whatever. But if you try to um, not think about this, but just for your enjoyment, which one is one of the tracks you like the most and why? Oh, I feel it's very difficult, you know, to answer. But of course, yeah. every driver has a favorite one. Um, I love Monaco. I mean, mm -hmm. who not? Um, of course. It's very tricky because you have no runoffs. Yeah. You have this super narrow track. You are like in a train, you know, all the barriers are just passing the sides. Uh, it's quite a, I still claim it's, it's the most exciting track which we have. Yeah. So I, I like it maybe because of that, you know, I was every time scared to death when I'm racing there, but You know, it, it's quite special. So Monaco is at the doorstep. That's right. How do you approach such a, as you said, a very tricky track? Because, I mean, you do something wrong, you end up in a wall, most likely, um, because there are so many around that, or you fall off a little cliff. Um, it always costs money in Monaco when you do something wrong. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so how do you prepare? Let's, let's speak particularly about Monaco because it's now very close. Yeah, that's right. In two weeks' time... Uh, We're racing there. Um, how do I prepare? I do prepare a little bit more for Monaco than for our races, I have to admit. So I look at my old notes. Mm -hmm. So when I raced for the first time in Monaco, I did a like track walk with, uh, with a coach of mine. Mm -hmm. And I did many notes um, about corners, how to approach it, car positioning, braking points. Because mm -hmm. it's so essential, it's so important in Monaco. Otherwise, you know, things just happen quickly. So I always look at my notes. I go to simulator. I have a home simulator, very simple, but it helps just to mm -hmm. refresh your mind where to go, where to be, you know, in certain moments uh, for certain corner. And it's corner by corner by corner. Yeah. There's no time. You have never time to think about what just happened because there's a, right there is the next corner. So, so I try to refresh my memory about the flow of the circuit. Um, so this is like the theoretical side. And yeah, well, I try to a little bit go to gym more than before because yeah. it's so <laughs> physical. Yeah. There's no time to rest. Not even nothing. No big yeah. straight. There's always something. So. Also, do you change your diet and your lifestyle a little bit? No. No, well, I'm no. Too short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I like no, that. I, uh, yeah. I try to stay away a little bit of, you know, um, during the race weekend or whatever, like two days yeah. before that, I'm I'm pretty, you know, I have a good discipline. So I try to stay yeah. away long nights or too many drinks. So I learned my lesson. So <laughs> I try to be good enough. Let's not forget, um, of course, historic racing is an amateur's race, in a sense. Of course, professional drivers are participating as team members, but it is an amateur's race. Um, how annoying do you find it of people who, let's say, who think they could drive, but they really can't? Is that a danger also? Like, I could imagine on a track like Monaco, and we don't need to mention names, obviously, but on a track like Monaco, uh, this could be really tricky, no? 
That's such a mean question, you know, like, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, oh, dear, how to answer this one without yeah, coming to close? Look, we all sort of have our stories and uh, experience with the others, and we have a book of excuses, you know? Yes. So if something goes wrong, you can you know, claim the other one, was it? Um, however, I didn't forget that I was a beginner only, whatever, nine, ten years ago. And I must have been absolutely pain, you know, yeah. out there because you just try to stay away, but you never actually do it. You, yes, you have it in Monaco a little bit less because they really care that you have certain experience in racing. Mm -hmm. In Le Mans, I have to say that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You do see drivers or experienced drivers out there who really race for the very first time in their life. And uh, you sort of, from experience, you recognize it quite quickly. So you just stay away or don't overtake uh, necessarily when you really think he's not even looking at the mirrors. Yeah. Of course, it's annoying. It's annoying on a qualifying lap and so on and so on. But honestly, we were all beginners. I was there and I'm sure I did many, you know, strange things. Um, yeah, I had to live with that. But yeah, I have stories. I have many stories, but I'm not sharing it now. Okay, <laughs> okay, no okay, okay. So uh, those no who names. tuned in, I tried my very best, but Katrina is <laughs> a real comrade and doesn't share any of the details. What happens on the track stays on the track and that's it. Absolutely, that's right. And, you know, right. I'm hoping that the others are not sharing the stories about me than what yeah. I've done. You know? I will try. I will definitely try to find <laughs> yes. out. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> but let's get back to the upcoming race in Monaco. What car will you be racing? I'm racing a 1954 Cooper Jaguar T33. Nice. Um, Cooper, again, also in relation to BMW. Everyone is happy. Just joking. No, go apart. Sorry. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so because we have so many cars, we yep. can't do a standing start. Oh, we had it, I think, only once so far. So we have a rolling start, which is different to all other races. Uh, on Could grid. you describe that for those who really know knowledge about racing, what that means, a rolling start? Sure, sure. So we, we start on grid. We find our position on grid. means that you remember on which side you are, on mm -hmm. the left side or on the right side. And then you go on a green flag lap, means formation lap. Uh, you're following the safety car. Uh, you can warm up your tires. You can, you know, warm up your brakes. And then you follow safety car all the lap towards the start line. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, the safety car pulls in, switch off the lights. You're not allowed to warm up your tires anymore. No overtaking. And you have to take your position means stay in the formation next to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you are not allowed to overtake until you cross the start line. Yeah. After that, you can overtake and the race officially starts for you. Means all the cars in front of you will be already speeding up. However, you have to stay and wait until the car in front of you cross the start line. Yeah. Um, funny connection to your question before, I had it really last time that um, someone with maybe less experience was warming up to tires uh, until the start line. And yeah. we were not allowed to overtake means... All the cars in front of us were gone and we had to wait until this particular car realized the race is on. So, and then you're, yeah, then you're racing and then everything is in the same way like any, any other race. And you start to breathe maybe then at some point. Yeah, absolutely. So then the start goes on and then you, where's the quickest part of that track? Well, the quickest part is in the end of the straight. Mm -hmm. So, where is the starting finish line? Yeah. Um, that is the quickest part. You have uh, a pretty tricky right-hand corner up to the casino square. So, yeah. you, you really have to make sure that you break there. There's one of the few runoffs. So, because it happens, you know, they overshoot, you overshoot that corner, you are too quick. Yeah. Uh, so, there's a, thank God, a small runoff in case you're not going to make it. Then you go up to the casino square. I managed to spin twice in two races <laughs> in Monaco. Uh, you know, some friends are joking. They should rename the corner after my name because I spun twice and never hit the yeah. wall. I mean, that's no, a miracle. That's very good. But I have to say, Katerina, it's logical because it's roulette time, right? So um, <laughs> you're close to a roulette. So you play it also on the track. 
<laughs> yeah, this is, you're absolutely right. That there's something mental. Yeah. Because when I'm approaching this corner, you know, it's just the approach to Casino Square. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about it. And I'm and, and I and, and the moment you think about these things, like, mm. oh my God, what I've done last time when I spun. Yeah. <laughs> and it bang, there is it, right? Yeah. So it, 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 yeah, it's my corner. Um and yeah, well, and you have a casino square. Well, that's why it's that's fine. You know, you just you just try to keep as much speed as as possible, and uh, then you know, tight the tight corners that happen at the Fairmont Hotel, as you know, everybody watching there. I mean, that's my favorite watch spot because uh, to spot the race, that's my favorite spot. Yeah, it's the slowest part of the track, maybe. Yes, <laughs> it's good. You for can see the cars, <laughs> but many many underestimate that uh, maybe they're a bit too quick as well. So that's. Uh, it's, uh, oh, I'm sure you can tell some stories from that corner. I think so. But as I follow your advice and uh, we don't call someone out, especially not if uh, I'm not racing myself. So yes. you're absolutely right. You know, all this advice, you ask 10 people, you get 15 opinions how to do that corner correctly or in the right way. So, you know, at some point you, sh you shouldn't even sort of listen and just try to get around. Yes, and then, absolutely. Well, and you have a tunnel, of course, you know, we all... You know, fear that. Mm. So, what is the what's the tricky part in the tunnel? Is it like that you underestimate the end of it because at the end you have to brake quite hard, if I remember correctly? No. Um, yes. So there are two elements in terms of the tunnel in Monaco. One is, of course, it's not a straight. There is yep. a kink in the middle of the corner. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of the tunnel, so means you really have to do your line, otherwise it doesn't end up well. Uh, you have this darkness. And light um, yeah. means your eyes, you know, have to adjust straight away to the darkness and the other way around. You have to have your marker points some, somewhere because don't expect that you're going to see any king. Exactly. There. Yes. And then the heartbreaking <laughs> at the end. Yes. Amazing. I mean, uh, thank you very much for this little tour to <laughs> the track of Monaco. I think, um, I mean, you have to imagine your, the, the Cooper is a relatively quick car, isn't it? It's relatively quick car. There's a 3.4 liter engine yeah. with disc brakes, what is a huge advantage in Monaco. Yeah. And it's a very handful car. So it's quite heavy on the steering. Yeah. So, you know, half an hour. This is always the ha longest half an hour of my life. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, really, I'm really looking for the checkered flag. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not lying. And uh, my first Monaco, I still remember, was one of those moments when it was my first free practice in 2016 in mm -hmm. Monaco. I was so excited that the sweat was dripping out of my nose, down my nose <laughs> in the helmet. And it, was, it wasn't, it was you know, that I was so exhausted. It was the yeah. level of concentration and not breathing. And I never forget this sort of, you know, running my sweat yeah. <laughs> down my nose. Only in Monaco. <laughs> Only in Monaco. And I think it shows also the difficulty of the mental stress racing puts you really in. And this is why I think the best way to approach this is to have a muscle memory, in a sense, that helps you to focus on other stuff, because otherwise it's too overwhelming, I would assume. But if you drove a track very often or you prepare well as you do, then I think your muscles also know okay, where to put the tension in, in a sense. But the mental stress must be incredible. Also, like, especially if you're overtaking or if someone's pushing from the back or whatever. I think the tension is, is the biggest problem because mm. you don't relax that way you should. Because it's still half an hour, free mm. practice, half an hour next day of qualifying and half an hour is a race. Um, so you are extremely tense because yeah. of the excitement about, you know, so many things. And that is what makes you tired so... And this is the reason why race car drivers train so much, you know? Yeah. So many people out there think, why are you training? Like, you just sit there and turn the steering wheel, right? Yeah, exactly. So, but it's nothing. It's nah. nothing, yeah. But the better the physical side. Yes, it's so easy. It looks so easy. I'm very good at uh, Gran Turismo at PlayStation, so it's not a big <laughs> deal. Sorry. No. Clearly, it's almost yeah. the same. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> strike almost, it's the same. I mean, I, give me a car and I drive your Bentley in the best time around Monaco, I swear. Oh, I'm sure you're going yeah. to beat me straight away. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. We should do it. We should do our race. Let's do a free practice first and then maybe not in the Bentley, maybe something more affordable on my side because my insurance company will not be very happy if I hand in that ticket. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Those but those pre-war pre-war houses. Yeah. You do ask yourself what what are we doing? Yeah. 
you know, the brakes are horrendous, of course, you <laughs> yeah, know, course. but they're unpredictable horrendous. Yeah. It means it, when you get used to it, that you have to break way earlier how to break, for example, it's fine. You can really yeah. rely on them, for example. And Le Mans is just a perfect track for, yeah. for Bentleys because they love speed. They love long, floating, uh, yeah. um, straight. This is why Bentleys are really brilliant, brilliant there, especially. Um, of course, gear changing, you know, that's, that's a magic, you know, something is a, you, you have to figure out. It's a bit like a lottery. It is a bit like a lottery and, you know, um, I always, every good gear change without any crushing, you, you feel yeah. just good, you know, it's sort yeah, of hard. Nice, like, I it's so nice, it's so yes. nice. <laughs> but it's a funny thing in Lamont, I had it some years ago that in the night, because the gearbox is colder, right? Mm -hmm. the, the point, the time when you change a gear and how yeah. the refs you use and so on, it changed. And it was for me like new experience, like, wow. okay. So I had to do it in a different way in the night because of the of the temperature yeah. compared to the day and, and so on. But, you know, it happened to me also that I was in a wrong gear in a, in a corner because I didn't manage to change the gear. Yeah. So I think... You know, never believe a story uh, of someone who is claiming that they have it all. So, okay, they have that's, a certain... that's noted, duly noted. It's yeah, it's it's funny, and you know, we're going to come back to Portimao to the first twenty-four hour race. Yeah, we had these four girls, and some of them never driven Bentley before. So, mm -hmm. some of my team, and we've been driving on a parking lot when one of you know our friends, and they were learning the gear change before Amazing. the twenty-four hour race. And <laughs> Amazing. Then we agreed. That's the spirit. There is a spirit. Then we agreed, look, we leave it with these gears. It's not that easy to learn in one hour. We just go from first gear to fourth. And so this yeah. is a true story. We actually did 24 hours going from first gear to fourth. Perfect. And here you go. <laughs> so, the two gear race. Two gear race. Save gearbox and yeah. uh, help yourself. Amazing. I love that. Um, Katerina, do you feel fear when you're in the racetrack? It comes, it comes and goes. It's not always there. Mm -hmm. You, I personally, you know, fear, oh, the fear comes when you have a situation where you really think you over, over shot one and you were too mm -hmm. quick for a corner when something happens. I've seen some accidents, um, also bad ones. Mm -hmm. I wasn't involved, but I saw them or I was, I was, uh, you know, just there and you never forget these pictures. Mm -hmm. So. You know, also after I started to race modern cars, I realized how dangerous the classic cars mm. can be and actually are. And this fear is a little bit always there in the back of your mind. Um, but when there are moments, you know, where exactly the situation comes or during Mila Milia, it's the most unpredictable car mm. event in general with all the traffic, uh, you know, there were moments where I was thinking, this just doesn't go, this, this is not going to end up well. Mm. It, thank God did. But they, this is the moment where the fear is there and, and you are sometimes only passenger. You just really hope that, you know, there is the space and capable. time. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And um, would you say it's a good thing that this little point of fear is in the back of your mind and that you don't um, get overexcited and um, maybe put yourself in danger? Yes. I think it's good because it's never good when you drive on the limit. No one should do that, mm -hmm. but you know, we're all different. And also I personally claim there's a difference between men and women in racing because we have the self-preservation, uh, you know, element in us as a woman. Yeah. And I, I see myself and experience it very often that I, I do break earlier or I, I rather say, do you know what? I'm out of this situation. This is not worth it before I get into a moment, a situation which could end up badly. So um, I think everyone has a bit of fear in the back of their mind. And uh, it's also good when it comes regularly on the surface, yeah. because that is the moment where you realize in the end of the day, this is just a hobby. We should really take it easy. Yeah. Of course, you can be competitive, but don't be competitive crazy, because the only thing you win is a cigar in Goodwood. Yeah. We all wish, exactly. Right. <laughs> so you drive many different cars, uh, as we said, from pre-war to uh, the 60s and 50s, anything. I remember that uh, when we had Gabi on the podcast, uh, she says for her, the important thing is that the car is light. She likes to drive light cars. What is important for you reflecting to your race car? 
Well, with my Bentleys, I think uh, this doesn't count for me with the light cars. <laughs> Everybody always laughing, you know, um, at the rallies or racing, you're the lightest drive on the heaviest car. Yeah. <laughs> so that element is just, just that doesn't work for me. Uh, for me, most important, um, I have to feel as a one unit with the car. When I feel that with the car, that's that's for me super, super good. And, I, you know, straight away, the results look different. Yeah. So for race car in general, you know, I, I like, you know, that I have a sitting position to start with, which I I feel I have the overview. I always love to have the overview in the car. In a way, I have an angle I don't see properly. Um, I just, honestly, I, I drive like Miss Daisy and I always yeah. going about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, surely, you know, have a, you know, big engines. We all love it. I'm, I'm not going to lie, you know. Um when I have the choice uh, between slightly underpowered cars or, you know, less horsepower, you know, surely I go for the, for the bigger one. Even it's a heavier car. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Main thing, it sounds good. And and you have this sort of uh, the driving fun. No, but it's, it's very interesting because everyone has its own uh, little um, preferences in a sense. That's it. Sure. I'm that easy in this. And um, no matter how heavy or light your car is, your car in a race needs a pit stop. And this brings us to our new little section here, which are our pit stop questions. So what we do is I will ask you a couple of this or that questions very quickly. And uh, I would love you to answer very quickly without thinking. Are you ready? Okay. Well, women overthink things, but I like to overthink, but let's go. Yeah, why not? So three, two, one, off we go. F1 or WRC World Rally Championship? Um, uh, WRC. Modern motorsport or historic motorsport? Historic. Nürburgring or Hockenheim? Nürburgring. Goodwood Revival or Festival of Speed? Goodwood Revival. Driving alone or driving with passengers? With passengers. Driving or get driven? Driving. Car sharing or no car? No car. <laughs> Road trip or racetrack? Racetrack. Stick shift or pedals? Stick shift. Engine in the front or in the back? Engine in the front. Engine in the front or in the middle? In the, in the front still. Left hand drive or right hand drive? A left hand drive. Left hand drive or center drive? Left hand drive. Sell or keep? Keep. Grand Prix white or British racing green? British racing green. Mint condition or enthusiastically driven? Enthusiastically driven. Wow, nice. That's that's it. It was very like, it doesn't hurt too much, right? <laughs> no, not at all. You said, uh, of course... You prefer the racetrack over the road trip? It, I think that was a mean. That would I accept that, as a that's mean That's a very question. mean question. Yeah. That's a very mean question because I really love both. So, of course, yes. racing because of racing. We, we talk about uh, that enough. But road trip is something, yeah, I love it. So, you know, I'm doing now the rally, as you know, and uh, from Beijing to Paris. And uh, we need I to had, talk about this, of course. Yeah, sure, sure. But I got a book for, for Christmas about, oh, and don't ask me the name, I really can't remember, Swedish, Scandinavian driver from 1925. So she mm -hmm. is, a, is a woman, a female driver. She drove around the world in one year, 1925, 26, or in two years, around the world, so across the world. And of course, if I look at the map, which showed where she drove and, and which countries she, she visited, I had straight away on my mind, I want to do in a similar way the same, because mm -hmm. from Beijing to Paris, I will already have to have behind me. So end of the year, I want to just do the same and I want to, you know, cross America and go cross Japan and so on. And just really within the car and just drive across the world. So a road trip, back to your question. I love it. I love it too. So unfair. It's 50-50. I mean, this is one of the toughest things you can do in historic motorsport, actually, because you really drive your butt off there. Because I mean, there are long stages. And, you know, I hope that uh, due to the current uh, situation, that everything ease up a little bit because you pass uh, Iran as well, I think, right? No, we are um, driving China. 
Okay. Yes, through Kazakhstan. Uh, okay, you go down lower. Azerbaijan, okay. Georgia, yeah. Turkey, that. Okay, because I, I remember uh, the first time I was taking part in one of the of the stints there. So um, uh, they were coming back just from Iran and this was mm. very exciting. That's course, right. But yeah. I mean, nowadays you don't want to go there. But this is really like a challenge. Are you taking a Ford Mustang? Yes, I'm um, taking 1967 Hero One uh, Ford Mustang, yeah. which uh, has been built uh, by by ProDrive. So I'm very, you know, have a high confidence into the car, and 60 years of Ford Mustang. So yes, I think it's the of right course. year to take to take Mustang uh, on the road, and it's a very unusual yeah. car, you know, for for me personally. Um, but who is joining you? Well, I'm driving with a very good friend of mine and a, and a team. Mm -hmm made from the own team is John Minshaw, uh, who yeah. was one of the you know, mentors at the beginning, as we talk about, you have to have people yeah. who help you. So he was one of them. Um, so we know each other so well. We know each other for 10 years and race together, race against each other. And you have to have someone in the car who you really know sure. in, in highs and lows and you can fall out and you're good again, you know. So, yeah, yeah it is for his for him, it's the first endurance sort of long distance rally. Yeah. So we will see how it goes. You know, it's kind of life changing, once a lifetime experience, Absolutely. I think, for both of us. Uh, the moment he drops out, let me know. I jump in. <laughs> yes. I will call you and then, uh, you know, <laughs> fit you in the nope. car somehow. But is there a special preparation you did for that race? Yes. I mean, the Beijing to Paris is my personal biggest motoring yeah. experience so far. And I think it will stay there on top of, of, of all experiences I've done. The preparation goes now for over a year. And, you know, in many ways, it means, you know, it's the car itself, which is immense. You know, we spent three days with the team to learn how to change, you know, dumpers, how to change mm. uh, tires, how to, you know, check sure. up car, everything. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've never done that. You know, I'm just, I'm just a lazy driver and navigation, learning navigation properly and, uh, you know, learning the car itself because we have all spare parts with us. Mm -hmm. We have all tools we have to carry, carry this with us. No supporting cruiser actually yeah. allowed in the spirit of 1907. Yes. Uh, what is what is fantastic, yeah, I think. Uh, so we have to be able, we have to be in position to fix our car ourselves. So we had to learn where are uh, which parts, spare parts, where they're hidden in the car, um, and so on. So you, there are really many, many other parts, you know, from uh, from the preparation which are new to me, and I think it's a part of the journey. I am really taking it as already a journey. Uh, this just you know being nervous and excited about it. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I have the highest respect for Duso because that's really something um, very special, no, very, I, very special. I can still can't believe I'm doing it, but, you know, I think it's everyone who loves cars and have the opportunity and chance to do it. I think you should do it. Of course, so you should always, do it too. always, <laughs> right. And I think with this, Katerina, wishing you all the best and good luck for this big challenge. And thank, thank you. you very much for taking your time before this tight preparations for Monaco and for the big race, uh, Beijing to Paris. And um, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, having me. Thank you very of much. Of course, it was uh, super cool. And of course, I would like to thank everyone who tuned in today and listened to our little chit chat about the historic racing world. And uh, I could not imagine someone better than Katerina to take us through all this. And uh, I would like also to thank the whole team who is behind our little podcast which is Robin, who holds all the ends together. Then we have Federica, who takes care of all the content in terms of the editing. And of course, Alex and Marcos from Scenario Studio, who take care of the good sound. And if you like what you hear, please do us a favor and give us as much stars as possible. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button, leave us comments, and uh, please send us ideas of guests like Katerina we would like to have. Uh, it's a really pure enjoyment to do this for you guys, and we hope that you enjoy it. Katerina, thank you very, very much for being with us today. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me and, you know, for the chance to share, you know, the stories and, and the passion with others. So and we could do this for it. hours. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye.